to introduce Professor Mark Redfield. Mark, after studying at Yale and Cornell, uh, taught at the University of Geneva and then at Claremont Graduate School down the road, uh, uh, where he was John B. and Lillian McGuire Distinguished Chair in the Humanities and later Dean of Arts and Humanities. He was understandably, though regrettably for those of us whom he left on the West Coast, snatched up in 2010 by Brown University, where he is chair of the Department of Comparative Literature and professor of English and Comparative Literature. His first book, his 1996 book, Phantom Formations, Aesthetic Ideology in the Broken Cinema, was awarded the Modern Language Association Prize for a first book, and was followed by The Politics of Aesthetics, Nationalism, Gender, Romanticism, published in 2003. Um, his work began to acquire a kind of more urgently political tone uh, in 2009 when he published The Rhetoric of Terror, Reflections on 9-11 and the War on Terror, which was described by David Simpson as a resolutely convincing case for the power of theory in understanding and contesting the peculiar speech acts that sovereign power has enacted and embodied in response to 9-11 and the exceptional conditions it has been used to justify. And I think that today is also a good moment to think about what is the power of theory? What power does it invest in us as critical thinkers to wade our way through this um, equally troubling uh, moment? Theory at Yale, The Strange Case of Deconstruction in America, which was published by Fordham in 2016, was described by Rachel Boldy as part cultural and institutional history, part exegesis and critique of key writers' work, and part reflection on the impossibility of smoothly bringing together these two frames of analysis. He's also co-edited a number of uh, volumes, including I Anxiety, Cultural Studies and Addiction, Legacies of Paul Duran, Points of Departure, Samuel Weber Between Sexuality and Reading, which I didn't even know about. It came out in 2016 last year, and I, I just ordered it from Amazon. He's also guest edited special issues of the journal Diacritics, Romantic Passive, and the Word Voice Circle, and authored over 60 articles. He is currently at work on two edited volumes, The Correspondence of Jacques Derrida and Paul Deman, and that's um, with Martin McQuillan, Patricia Deman, and Kevin Newmark and Theory at the Millennium, a volume, a volume honoring the work of Jonathan Keller, with whom he studied, I believe, at Cornell, uh, and that's collided with Avery Slater. Today's talk, The Cut of the Shibboleth, Language, Borders, and the Fascination of Fascism, is part of his current book project, which I understand does not yet have an official title, but I think you'll be taking requests in the Q&A. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So I will. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mark Redfield. Thank you. Um, I have a I have a handout, uh, so maybe Erin, you could kindly pass that around. I'm not sure this. Do you know how to turn this on in any? She said it's already on. She said it's already so on. Okay. So so good. So thank you everyone for coming. I know how busy life is, and to come to lunch talks is not easy. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for the invitation. This is really a wonderful chance for me to present work. And what I'm going to be doing is offering you um, a badly stitched together lecture today, um, which means I'm more than usually keen to receive feedback during the question period, since you're about to be presented with extracts from a project that I'd like to find a way to integrate as a project, even though its components go off in at least two different directions. Schematically put, can all of you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, schematically put, one line of research bears on the notion and figure of the shibboleth um, as it descends to us in the story from the Bible and was powerfully rethought and refigured in the later 20th century by Paul Celan and Jacques Derrida and, of course, by other artists and thinkers. The image on the poster here is uh, 
a detail from uh, Dora Salcedo's quasi-temporary installation titled Shibboleth at the Tate Modern in 2007-2008. And I'll say a really quick word about that at the end of my, S of my talk. <clears throat> the other line of research takes up a phrase made famous by Susan Sontag as the title of an essay, Fascinating Fascism, published in the New York Review of Books in 1975 an essay that's mainly an attack on Lenny Riefenstahl, but uh, also offers some telling cultural generalizations. My hunch is that most of you would rather follow out that second theme a little ways. So for today's presentation, I propose to start with and spend most of my time parsing the fascinations of fascism in our dark times. And then late in the talk, shift rather abruptly to the biblical story of the shibboleth and say a few words about the line of thought that I'm following out there. So, um, let's see if this works, okay. Uh, yes, by fascism, this is also on your handout, but there are a couple of images that aren't. By fascism, Sontag, like practically everyone contributing to the Anglo-American public sphere, really means Nazism. And her strongest claims about our fascination with fascism invoke Nazism, and this is the first quote on your handout. It's generally thought that National Socialism stands only for brutishness and terror, but this is not true. National Socialism, or more broadly fascism, also stands for an ideal, and one that is also present today, persistent today under other banners. The ideal of life as art, the cult of beauty, the fetishism of courage, the dissolution of alienation in ecstatic feelings of community, the repudiation of the intellect, the family of man under the parenthood of leaders. The second half of Sontag's essay takes up the fetishistic and not infrequently literally pornographic power of SS memorabilia, particularly uniforms. Quote, why the SS? Because the SS seemed to be the most perfect incarnation of fascism in its overt assertion of the righteousness of violence, the right to have total power over others and to treat them as absolutely inferior. She goes on in the essay to reflect on the eroticization of fascism, the appeal of the violent and the irrational, and the power of fascism as sadomasochistic theater. Closing her essay with one of those grand sentences that she was so good at writing. Now there is a master scenario available to everyone. The color is black, the material is leather, the seduction is beauty, the justification is honesty, the aim is ecstasy, the fantasy is death. I've given you these citations from Sontag not because I necessarily wish to endorse any of her claims straightforwardly, but because they launch several of the interrelated questions that I'd like to pursue. How best to address ourselves to a fascination that is by no means restricted to the aesthetic and cultural phenomena on which Sontag is focusing, that displays itself in mainstream as well as far-right American cultural, cultural and political discourse particularly in the wake of Donald Trump's successful campaign for the presidency, but that seems to have roots going back to the 1930s and 1940s. How best to interpret the toxic, though also comic, campy, quirky, afterlife of specifically Nazi symbols and references in this history? How best to approach perhaps not so much the somewhat exhausted question of what fascism is as the question of why and how that question fascinates and drives us? Perhaps that last formulation will seem naive, um, given the recent surge of right-wing nationalist victories and insurgencies in Europe, the election of Trump in the US, the newly empowered media presence of white supremacist agitators on both continents. We don't need to wonder why we're thinking and talking about fascism, you may object. We're simply responding to a clear and present danger, if not to a disaster that has long since gathered us in and is now speeding up the process of taking the world down. And I wouldn't disagree. The penumbra of excess on which I want to focus halos a question that we have every urgent intellectual and political reason to ask. Yet, of course, we also therefore have every urgent and intellectual uh, and political reason to do so carefully. The invocation of fascist regimes of the 1920s and 30s does not always best help us understand either the contemporary neo or parafascistic movements or the mainstream displays, mainstream in quotation marks, <coughs> it's hard to say where the stream is sometimes, 
displays of xenophobia, nationalism, racism, and militarism that have, medi have a mediated and at most semi-acknowledged relationship to those far right movements. Parenthetically, let's make the obvious point that the crises that afflict and empower the global, corporate, and national security state world order differ significantly from those that enabled early 20th century fascisms. Taking up briefly the most media-saturated figure of our contemporary moment, Trump, we might venture something like the following. First, that this strange, dangerous, hyper figure represents a politics, to the extent that we can still use that word, with fascistic elements. Here are some uh, thoughts. An injured and savage nationalism, xenophobia, contempt for rational thought and for existing laws, institutions, and norms. But second, that it is probably less helpful to think of Trump as the incorporated intersection of fascism and capitalism that the Frankfurt School diagnosed during the classic phase of fascism and early monopoly capitalism, than to try to work out the ways in which he represents a mutation of fascistic elements in the era of neoliberalism, hyper-globalized finance capital, billionaire dark money, reality TV, Facebook, and Twitter, not to mention thermonuclear war and environmental catastrophe. The signature dynamism and future-oriented rhetoric that classic fascism blends with atavistic appeals to national and ethnic tradition has been replaced with a sense of a blocked or disappearing future. Trump lacks the nation-shaping ideology of a Hitler or a Mussolini. The, fi the figure of the dictator artist belongs to that era. He does not have available to him the pursuit of territorial expansion, quite the opposite. His master trope is a wall. He has no international Bolshevism to oppose, only the odd and impertinent nation state, Iran or North Korea, or the mobile, decentered enemy, invariably styled Islamo-fascism. No dynamic of renewal. All that is left is a reactive, race-baiting formula, make America great again. His mass rallies at which he appears his, at his most traditionally fascistic, galvanizing his crowds into ecstasies of populist anger, are tied, are tied into the new streams of accelerated political and epistemological violence that the internet has enabled. Virtual phenomena that in, that in turn generate mass-mediated real-world performances of alt-right violence at pre-selected sites, these right now being mainly college campuses. Inevitably, those supposedly alt manifestations will involve swastikas. That gets us back to the question with which I started. If Trump's presidential campaign and electoral victory generated a surge of interest in fascism and in mainstream mass and social media, interest in fascism in mainstream mass and social media outlets, the reference was always to the fall of the Weimar Republic in 1933 the exemplary catastrophe. Pretty much never to Mussolini's march on Rome. And just out of curiosity, how many of us here would get a reference to 1922, if one threw it out? Um, maybe a few, but in this room. The spike of commentary on fascism necessarily included reflection on the long history of American commentary on what American fascism would look like. Canonical alternative histories from Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, 1935, to Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, 2004, gained renewed notice, as did a well-known remark often wrongly attributed to Sinclair Lewis, dating from the late 1930s, quote, when and if fascism comes to America, it will not be labeled made in Germany, it will not be marked with a swastika, it will not even be called fascism. It will be called, of course, Americanism, end quote. The little kick that makes that phrase memorable is its hint that fascism might not be recognized even when it does arrive. It might come to America without immigration papers. It might already be here. No news, of course, to readers of the Dialectic of Enlightenment. But a certain excess seems likely to trail along. Call it the Richard Spencer effect. The, sorry. The capitalist and con man who is elected president may be draped in stars and stripes, 
and may restrict his American-style race baiting to coded signals. But in the well-lit margins, there will be someone like Spencer shouting, Hail Trump, giving speeches peppered with national, national socialist code words, to the point of inserting one in German, Lügenpresse, although he didn't pronounce it correctly. Someone in short, <laughs> the professor said snidely, someone in short who will be coyly eager to have his discourse labeled made in Germany, to have everyone know how very close his product is to being marked with a swastika. And Spencer, as I'm sure you remember, did in fact receive Nazi salutes from his audience in the speech to which I'm referring, given at the Ronald Reagan building in Washington, D.C. some days after the election. This is by no means a particularly American phenomenon. Similarly, teasing evocations of Nazism characterize the rhetoric not just of extremist fringe groups, but of electorally ambitious xenophobic parties throughout much of the world, including, sometimes it seems above all, in countries like Greece or Russia that suffered gruesomely under Nazi occupation. And the news was full of the, of the march in Poland uh, yesterday, if some of you saw the, uh, the headlines. One thing to note, therefore, is that in certain contexts, fetish symbols of Nazism have the power to block specific national histories. Assuming that these symbols have become the limit sign of modern white racism, more on that in just a second, their ability to overbid national history confirms Etienne Balibar's insight that, quote, racism is not an expression of nationalism, but a supplement of nationalism, or more precisely, a supplement internal to nationalism, end quote. It's an excess over nationalism that requires the production of a, and here I'm quoting his words again, quasi-hallucinatory visibility of false nationals, Jews, blacks, etc. To the point of allowing, in certain contexts, the incorporation of non-nationals under the sign of race. And this happened historically with Himmler's Waffen-SS, for instance, which over the course of the war became an international organization. The swastika in particular has become the vehicle of that excess. Flattened out into a sign of racially marked xenophobia, the swastika functions as the closest thing to a magical or diabolical sacred sign that, se that secular Western culture possesses, generating energy across a variety of semiotic contexts, political, social, pornographic. With rare exceptions, it resists parody or resignification as camp. It retains its toxicity even as a penciled scrawl. Supplementally energized by the Western and particularly American mass cultural uptake of the Holocaust since the mid-1960s, it effaces the history of other fascisms along with other national histories. It thus comes to signal evil on a quasi-theological level while shadowing from the margins the hegemonic or structural forms of racism and xenophobia in late capitalist societies. Hence the Spencer effect that I suggested earlier rendered more visible in proportion to Trump's exacerbation of the race baiting that has played such an important role in mainstream U.S. political discourse, excuse me, ever since overt racism receded from mainstream political utility. But I think we need to press this matter a bit further, as shrewd observers such as Susan Sontag and Saul Friedlander suggested it uh, decades ago. The Trump and Spencer pattern, teasing disavowal at the center while swastikas are waved at the margins, repeats itself not just in political context, but in nearly every case in which invocations, images, or to borrow Friedlander's term, reflections of Nazism are in play. The political slant of these contexts is most often non-fascist, or for that matter, non-existent, unless one's understanding of the political is very broad or highly sophisticated. Most of the examples which I'm about to allude to fall under Sorry, fall under the rubric of entertainment or parody. The point I want to emphasize in what follows is this. Whatever the genre, medium, or tone, the references to Hitler and the Third Reich that saturate our society very often involve patterns of doubling as well as gestures of expulsion. The Nazi is, of course, the enemy who can be slaughtered without guilt in video games, films, books, but he's also the enemy who might also possibly be us, 
assuming, and this point is crucial and will need to be elaborated far more carefully than I'll be able to do today, assuming that we identify as or can be taken to be white. This doubling has a long history. It goes back at least to the later 1930s. Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator famously builds its comedy around a literalized corporeal doubling. And even US wartime propaganda throws up some intriguing insta instances of the enemy looking strangely like us. The 1943 Disney classic cartoon propaganda piece, Der Führer's Face, teases viewers in its closing scene with um, an overlap between the Hitler statue, so Hitler salute and the Statue of Liberty's extended arm. Donald Duck wakes up from his nightmare of being a worker slave in Hitler's Germany, draped in the American flag rather than the swastika, but as he wakes, he sees what looks like a Hitler salute shadow and he snaps to hiling until he realizes that the shadow is a, of a statuette reproduction of uh, the Statue of Liberty sitting on his windowsill casting a fascist shadow. He runs to his fetish and kisses her. He has escaped from his nightmare world in a Nazi bomb factory only to wake up in a soft fascist America that remains haunted by its shadowy double. It seems that no matter what their politics or level of education or genre they're writing in, people for decades have been alive to proximities and intersections between fascism on the one hand and liberal democracy generally and the United States in particular on the other. I could spend the next hour giving you examples of patterns of doubling and identification in more recent objects of high and, and low culture or mass culture. In the domain of high culture, think of Jonathan Littell's Prix Goncourt winning novel Les Bienveillants, The Kindly Ones, 2006, narrated from the point of view of an SS officer and war criminal, or Laurent Binet's Prix Goncourt winning HHHH from 2009 with its anguished meditation on the narrator's fascination with Heydrich, Reinhard Heydrich, or going back a few years, George Steiner's quite awful and pretentious The Portage to San Cristobal of A.H., 1981, uh, with its elaborate symmetries between the Jewish Nazi hunter Liebo and the A.H. whom he hunts and who notoriously delivers the novel's final speech. Hitler delivers the novel's final speech in the novel, right? In which he claims to have learned racism from the Jews. Many more instances of high art fas fascination with Nazi kitsch in the 1970s are examined in Saul Friedlander's still very helpful study, Reflections of Nazism from 1982, to which I alluded earlier, and there's a snippet on your handout that I'm not going to read. Well-known artworks have reflected on these reflections. For instance, the controversial Mirroring Evil exhibit at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1998, uh, later published as a book by Scala, the most famous piece, by Piotr Uklansky titled The Nazis, probes affinities between Hollywood celebrity and our culture's Nazi obsession by displaying photos of famous actors in Nazi uniforms. In the domain of popular culture, it's hard even to know where to begin, what with all the media forms available, but let me give a shout out to an amusing recent Nazi zombie splatter film from Norway, Dead Snow. Has anyone seen Dead Snow? Uh, <laughs> 2009 in which near the end of the film, the zombie SS commander, Standartenführer Herzog, the name of course a cinematic in-joke, confronts his two remaining human opponents and with a handful of Nazi zombies at his side, speaks the film's only zombie word, as it's a distorted, roaring, but comprehensible theological command, Aufstehen, arise. Out through the undead snow pop hands and arms, and Nazi zombies scrabble up through the ground like grotesque postmodern afterimages of the Spartoi in the myth of Cadmus' founding of Thebes. If you remember your myths, so is the dragon seeds and warriors spring up. Uh, this shot offers us a comic synecdoche for the proliferation of Nazis in Western culture and media since the end of the war. It's the visual analog of the plot twist of Ira Levin's Boys from Brazil, 1976, with its legions of cloned baby Hitlers scattered across the world. If not usually as literal zombies or clones, though tropes of replication very often figure in this literature, which again is so often concerned about doubles and doubling, 
Uh, Nazis come at us unstoppably practically everywhere we look. They stalk movies, TV programs, novels, history books, comic books, art exhibits, pornography, first-person shooter video games, internet memes, and the idiom of political invective. To the point that a modest body of scholarship on Nazis in popular culture has emerged out of the snow as well, like a real-world materialization of the Hitler studies founded by the narr narrator of Don DeLillo's parodic masterpiece, White Noise, 1985. Um, and the real-world version of the doyen of such Hitler studies in the Anglophone world is a scholar named uh, Gabriel Rosenfeld, who's written a series of books that try to list, it's a Herculean task, the most notable books, films, etc., featuring Hitler over the past half century. Um, this is still not to speak of more culturally marginal forms such as occult movements, UFO conspiracy theories, punk rock styles, pornographic cosplay, etc., or of right-wing bands, political figures, authors, books, etc. It is no surprise that only the barest traces of the specific ideology and historical event of National Socialism tend to be found in such mainstream media phenomena. As Nazism dissolves into the abstract villainy of the Nazi as an endlessly killable, and in that sense endlessly undead, novelistic or cinematic or digital enemy, into an ensemble of fetishistic accoutrements, uniform symbols, into a mass-produced insult available, adaptable to any occasion. And finally, to the auto-referential dynamics of internet fads, cats that look like Hitler, which are called Kittlers, uh, <laughs> things that look like Hitler, uh, <laughs> which is another sequence, uh, the famous downfall meme, which I'm sure many of you know. You see that I'm getting lost in a sub-epic list. Let me just reiterate as I close this enumeration the frequency with which these popular forms set up a mirroring relationship with the Nazi. A touch of this is legible even in the comic meme, X looks like Hitler. The mirroring relationship is almost always temporary, and except in very light comedy or white power hate speech, is almost always followed by a gesture of expulsion, as the Nazi who looks for a moment like us is defeated and expelled. The rationale of the doubling pattern is rarely conceptually articulated or based on historical information, although we can note that with the ascendancy of Trump, general readership his histories have appeared on such topics as the admiration that Hitler expressed in Mein Kampf for the US's genocidal Western expansion, or the substantial recourse that Nazi lawyers had to US race laws when they were crafting the Nuremberg Laws. So some of these books have appeared in the last nine months oh, and get reviewed in you know, the New York Review of Books. Often the tone is campy and satirical, as in Timo Vorn Swola's Iron Sky from 2012, in which Nazis from the moon, moon Nazis are a big thing um, in popular culture, moon Nazis help a Sarah Palin parody US president with her PR campaign. And in a somewhat darker vein, consider, and this will be my last example, the popular American uh, video product, The Man in the High Castle, um, Amazon video product, sorry, which unlike the Philip K. Dick novel, urges us to identify, if ambivalently, with the American SS officer John Smith, you know, his everyman name, in the, and in the closing episode of season one, identifies The Man in the High Castle as Hitler himself and Eminence Gliese, who has collected a master library of films that represent alternative histories. Hitler is the sovereign spectator and voice of wise authority in season one. In season two, and I apologize about the spoiler if you haven't seen it, Himmler becomes the benevolent Eminence Gliese, who prevents the nuclear war that the uber-evil Heydrich is trying to start. That's how far the road leads these days. To be sure, Mass culture thrives on an awareness of the totalitarian genome of the national security state, as witnessed by the inexhaustible production of dystopic futures and plots that pit heroes against opaque and murderous gover government agencies, the heroes typically being former trainees of precisely those agencies. Furthermore, it's plausible that the ferocious history of, Amer of American racism, chattel slavery, and genocide is being at once represented and repressed when Nazi villains and white-identified American protagonists enter into ambivalent specular relationships. And I make that argument elsewhere with relation to Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. I'd be happy to 
say more about that in the Q&A if you want. But such considerations, necessary though they are, do not entirely explain why Nazis proliferate across so many genres and tonal registers. Given the strange affinity in mass culture between entertainment Nazis and a complex of phenomena associable with modern techniques, rockets, cloning, media transmission, film, etc. Given all that, the post-Heideggerian analysis that Philippe Lacoulabart and Jean-Luc Nancy offer in their essay, The Nazi Myth, in Critical Inquiry, uh, 1990, opens a promising path. So these are the quotations I'll be reading from that essay, which I highly recommend. Seeking to emphasize both the specificity of Nazism as a historical event and the broader Western ideological formations on which this event drew, La Coulabart and Nancy diagnose a Nazi myth of myth, with myth defined not as narrative or representation, but as formative power. Quote, the power to bring together the fundamental forces and directions of an individual or a people, the power of a subterranean, invisible, non-empirical identity, the power of the dream, of the projection of an image with which one identifies. Myth is will to, will to myth, a power of belief that wills itself into existence by incarnating itself in a figure or type. The Aryan race typifies the solar myth of coming forth as figure, and it is no accident the swastika is a solar symbol. The Jew is not an opposite type, but the very absence of type, they argue. The parasite shadowing the solar Aryan myth. The burden of Labat and Nancy's demonstration is to emphasize both the abyssal differences and a crucial point of overlap between the National Socialist dream of self-presence and embodiment as spectacle on the one hand and mainstream Western metaphysics on the other. The Nazi myth of self-engenderment is, quote, finally nothing more than the absolute self-creating subject, a subject whose essential property is not solely cognitive, like the subject of Descartes, not solely spiritual, Eckehoff, nor solely speculative, Hegel, but which somehow groups together and transcends all these determinations in an immediate and absolute, absolutely natural essence, that of blood and race. The argument is not that Nazism was in any meaningful way an intellectual movement. The somehow, in the sentence I just quoted, registers the programmatic incoherence of the text by Hitler and Rosenberg that La Coulabart and Nancy have been examining. Nor certainly are La Coulabart and Nancy suggesting that the politico-mythical Nazi spectacle had anything other than an obfuscating relationship to the brutal realities of life in post-1933 Germany. Rather, quote, we wish only to underline just how much this logic with its double trait of the mimetic will to identify and the self-fulfillment of form belongs profoundly to the mood or character of the West in general, and more precisely to the fundamental tendency of the subject in the metaphysical sense of the word. So that's my high theory moment in this paper, which is otherwise, it's not. One way, therefore, to understand Western culture's lingering fascination with Nazism is as a half-disavowed negotiation of instabilities built into the modern subject the subject of aesthetics, techniques, self-formation. We might hypothesize that the Nazi spectacle, precisely because of its excess, its kitsch, its inadvertent comedy, its hyperbolic racism, its hidden in full view monstrous criminality, provides late capitalist global culture with a safely distant mirror in which to contemplate its own autoimmune disorder, its own addiction to me mediatized spectacle, its own racism, and lethal geopolitics. Capitalism sets in motion a thoroughgoing commodification of the world and requires for its full development the elaboration of global communicational and media systems. Under the impact of capitalism, all that is solid melts into air. The lure of an ever more profitable future devours the historical and traditional past. The standardizing yet also derealizing and deterritorializing effects of media become part of the fabric of quotidian life. And yet, as Samuel Weber writes, capitalist culture finds it necessary ceaselessly to cover over, at least partly cover over, the deterritorializing movement of its own mediatic reproduction. I have this quote from Sam. 
The media today are largely, although not exclusively, dominated by what can be called the economy of the self, defined as an instance that seeks to stay, stay the same over time and place by absorbing and assimilating all difference and alterity into itself. This contributes to the survival of what Benjamin was later to analyze as the aura, which seeks to manifest a distance in proximity that is ultimately grounded in the ostensible self-identity of what it surrounds. Benjamin pointed to the Hollywood star and the European dictator as two instances of the survival of the aura. But a less spectacular contemporary example would be what in American English is called the anchor of news broadcasts, who precisely serves to anchor a movement that otherwise might explode or at least crack the frame of the isolated images presented in the evening news. So we might therefore posit that one way to ward off the displacing and disseminating power of capitalist production and media technology, which is to say mediation in general, including linguistic mediation, finally, would be via a prophylactic detour through the Nazi, who, as the fanatic represent representative of a leader, takes the economy of the self to an extreme. That is, it might be that a certain ambivalent and temporary identification with this figure, this figure of the myth of self-fashioning through identification, enables the tacit acknowledgement and warding off of the impossibility of that very myth. The unmarked category of whiteness that makes the temporary identification possible will thus also be briefly troubled and reconfirmed, brought into salience, and then allowed to recede into the blankness of unmarked normativity. Because the sign Nazi performs an excessive reinstatement of the aura, over-incorporates the subject as race, folk, and Fuhrer, it circulates in mass culture as a figure of evil that is always potentially comic and campy, indexing a hyperbolic subject that is always already split and redoubled, scored by the very media displacement that it hyperbolically represses. That process accompanies the more sinister political doublings we evoked earlier. The swastika, emblem of this fascination with fascism at its toxic limit, is the fetish that unites mass reproducibility and racism, whereby the dislocative and disseminative force of modern techniques is disavowed as race identity, as xenophobia. In the scant time that remains, let me now turn to the other line of research I'm following out this year, the story and figure of the shibboleth. I know this is a bit of a jarring leap. And I, what I propose to do is leave aside the textual complexities that I'd normally spend most of my time unpacking in a talk like this, so as to sketch rapidly the large issues that concern me. But I do need to recall the biblical story of the Shibboleth test. It forms the capstone to the, to the story of Jephthah in Judges 11:12, a story characterized throughout by an exceptional degree of internecine violence within the patriarchal line. Jephthah is a mighty man of valor, begotten by Gilead, but the son of a harlot. And at the beginning of the narrative, Gilead's legitimate sons expel him from their territory. When the Ammonites attack Israel, however, the elders of Gilead seek out Jephthah and ask him to lead them in battle. And the first sign that, that speech acts will play an important role in the narrative comes as, as Jephthah bargains for sovereignty. He'll lead the Gileadites against the Ammonites if they in turn, will not just reintegrate him, but make him their, their permanent leader, their judge. Shall I be your head? And they say, the Lord be witness between us if we do not do so according to thy words. Jephthah, in turn, makes a vow unto the Lord, the guarantor of vows. Or better, he hubristically offers God a contract. Quote, and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth in the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. As mythic narrative demands, what comes forth out of the doors of his house is his own and only child. The child, a daughter who remains unnamed in the story, begs for two months to bewail her virginity, which are accorded her, after which the father, quote, did with her according to his vow and she knew no man." End quote. In the wake of this blood sacrifice, this grim counterpoint to the Abraham and Isaac story, the Ephraimites enter Gilead, um, angry that Jephthah has fought and presumably despoiled the Ammonites without them. There follows the famous story of the Shibboleth test, 
And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said to Jephthah, Wherefore passeth thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? Didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered me into my, into my hand, delivered them into my hand. And wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of the Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over. Then the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay. And they said unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of the Jordan. And there fell at the time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. Probably a symbolic number, but still indicative of a, a massive slaughter. I'm going to pass over the many philological, textual, and narrative complexities that this episode raises. If there's interest during the Q&A, we can talk more about how to read a connection between Jephthah's sacrifice of his daughter and the murderous story of the Shibboleth test, or between his precarious legitimacy and his effort to police a border between Gileadite and Ephraimite, which are tribes so similar a special test is necessary to set them apart. Both descend from Joseph and Azana, right? The biblical story of the Shibboleth is a story of internecine violence. Um, if, this, if there were time, I would dwell quite a while with this narrative and with the concept that emerges from it. For in the wake of this story, the word Shibboleth, in all its manifold spellings and pronunciations at different times and in different languages, has become the concept of the test the narrative describes. English is unique in having developed a considerably broader range of meanings for shibboleth, distributed between the seemingly opposite poles of test word or password on the one hand and slogan or cliche on the other. Um, the online resource dictionary.com offers the following very compact definition. Shibboleth, one, a peculiarity of pronunciation, behavior, mode of dress, et cetera, that distinguishes a particular class or set of persons. Two, a slogan, catchword. Three, common saying or belief with little current meaning or truth. That third definition, which so far as I know has no equivalent in other Western languages that I know, has become dominant in English. And I'm interested in that development. The multiple meanings of shibboleth in English, password, identifying mark, slogan, cliche, seem intriguingly key to certain large aspects of modern life, insofar as these meanings uh, tend to refer back to their own technical reproducibility. The semantic field that English calls shibboleth references the waning of the logos in an era of technical reproducibility, you could say. This word also seems to cue more specifically historical phenomena, the proliferation of tests, passwords, and checkpoints in a digitalized, stratified, fragmented, and militarized society that devotes much of its resources to the filtering and policing of populations, the hyperproduction and instantaneous outdatedness of signs, texts, and images under technically advanced consumer capitalism, with a concomitant emptying out of political institutions and an ever-increasing subordination of social life to the cash nexus and its language of equivalence. At present, millions of digital passwords are managed by shibboleth, maybe yours are too, mine is, uh, an open source software project that claims to be among the world's most widely deployed federated identity solutions connecting users to applications both within and between organizations. That's a quote from their webpage. The name was well chosen and can serve as a metonym for innumerable contemporary technologies and practices that go far beyond mere password management. Shibboleth, te shibboleth technologies, technologies as we may call them, of encryption and decryption, exclusion and inclusion, identification, privatization, exposure. Neoliberal ideologies, along with the economic, political, military, technical, and cultural phenomena we sum up as globalization, are unimaginable in their current form in the absence of such technologies, which flourish particularly when zones of indeterminacy are being created and leveraged. The binary logic of testing has a natural affinity with contexts in which it has become necessary or expedient to generate, parse, and intensively police identities. But here again, we seem to be touching on a particular determination of a much broader phenomenon, a test drive, as Avital Ronell has put it. 
ancient as metaphysics, but particularly coercive in the modern era, infiltrating seemingly every aspect of life, world, and thought. These large format considerations suggest there's something to be gained from focusing on the traditional and in non-English language context still current meaning of shibboleth as test word. The force of a test word resides in its resistance to knowledge or willpower. As Jacques Derrida comments, oops, I just have more stuff up here in case people are interested. As Jacques Derrida comments, it's in the body by reason of a certain impotence coming over their vocal organs, uh, but as an impotence of the body proper, of the already cultivated body, limited by barrier neither organic nor natural, that the Ephraimites experienced their inaptitude to pronounce, they nonetheless knew what they ought to be pronounced, shibboleth and not sibboleth. If the shibboleth te test opens and constitutes a figure for opening, the concept of the political in Carl Schmitt's sense as the opposition between enemy and friend, it does so as a lethal biopolitical inscription. In the story in Judges, 42,000 Ephraimites failed the shibboleth test and are killed at the border. <coughs> the number, though as I mentioned, almost certainly symbolic, suggests mass murder on a potentially genocidal scale. But, as has already been hinted, the possibility of this deadly sorting system derives from a more general condition of iterability that renders all borders and all codes permeable and all technologies of targeting vulnerable to error as the classic analyses of Derrida have demonstrated in numerous contexts. It will always be possible for an Ephraimite to pass the test or for a Gileadite to fail it. Such exceptions to the rule will then be ascribed to empirical contingencies. The Ephraimite is an exceptional mimic or had a Gileadic nanny. The Gileadite has a speech impediment or his attention wanders or the unconscious speaks. But exposure to such contingency forms a non-accidental part of the rule. No mark, signature, or speech act can function except insofar as it can go wrong, misfire, be repeated, forged, or cited, otherwise and elsewhere. If the shibboleth test provides the only guarantee that the other is other, this guarantee is unguaranteed. The friend-enemy distinction can never be truly secured. The sovereign moment of decision and the Schmittian political space produced by the shibboleth test are both derivative of a deeper condition of insecurity such that the self and other cannot be constituted in a specular relation without residue. Rather than being a contingent byproduct of the targeting process, finitude inhabits the shibboleth test from, as it were, the inside, opening it to an alterity that is also, and this is one of the major levers and challenges of Derrida's thought, constitutive of the singularity of a judgment or event, including the event of a poem. Somewhat paradoxically, given its blood-soaked origins, the figure of the shibboleth thus becomes, in the poetry of Paul Celan, and particularly by way of Derrida's reading, the watchword of an affirmative anti-fascist politics. Or better, it also becomes this. Derrida will stress the terrifying ambiguity of the shibboleth, sign of belonging and threat of discrimination, indiscernible discernment between alliance and war. <coughs> Writing and policing borders, the shibboleth also opens their unraveling and rewriting. And it is here that Derrida, reading Salon, cautiously affirms a promise of hospitality flickering in of all places the shibboleth. To the stranger, to the other, to the neighbor, to the guest, to whomever. This promise, which forms an ineradicable part of language, is precisely what modern racism seeks to repress, with the swastika as the most poisonous image of that repression. Now, I'm out of time, and I presume you're okay with my not elaborating on these points by a reading of a poem by Paul Salon. But let me just really, for one minute, um, uh, recall the well-known installation Shibboleth by the Colombian artist uh, Doris Salcedo in the Turbine Hall of the Tate Modern in London in 2007-8. Shibboleth was a jagged fissure 500 feet long in the floor of the enormous hall, running from a hairline crack to a gap a bit less than a foot wide. The sides of the cleft were polished and reinforced with wire netting, stretching the non-naturalness of the crack. Its bottom was never completely visible. People, people interacted energetically with it. I love this shot. <laughs> uh, and sometimes got bruised. Halfway through its tenure, according to one news report, 15 people had suffered minor injuries, <laughs> tripping and hurting, hurting themselves on it. <coughs> 
At the end of the period of time assigned to the installation in April 2008, the work was filled in or buried, reverse, reverse buried, you could say. A faint brownish scar remains on the floor of the turbine hall. Reviews of the work, often quoting Salcedo herself or referring to her distinguished history of political art making, typically stress how this installation wounds the ground or foundation of the museum, evokes division, brokenness, and pain, and allows savvy museum goers who know Salcedo's work to speculate about the damage done by colonialism, racism, imperialism, and capitalism. But what led her to call the work shibboleth? We've touched on a possible answer. Shibboleth, the word that means the non-semantic non cut of a word, is for that very reason both a potent weapon for border control and murderous violence, and a sign for the ineradicable promise of uncontrollable crossings. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this off. Is that okay? Yes. You need to, okay. <laughs> Is that what I said? I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, I think actually the talk was in both parts highly theoretical uh, and I will mostly inquire into the tropology that guides you in the first part, the, fascinate, the fascination of fascism. And because, you know, I think what was at work was Parallelism, you know, maybe a simile or even a synecdoche or metaphor between Nazism and Americanism. But as it turns out, and I think you will enjoy this as a student of uh, Ponte Magno, of course, uh, what really organizes the relationship between Nazism and Americanism is a chiasm. Uh, as it turns out, this is something painstakingly and painfully argued by James Whitman in a recent book, Hitler's American Model. The Nazis did not only admire the near decimation of the Native American by white European settlers, as well as uh, the segregation of Jim Crow South, which, as you know, is concurrent with Nazism. That is the global environment from which Nazism rises. Um, they also, as um, the core of the Nuremberg laws, took American citizenship laws and uh, American miscegenation laws. So it, that, that would be basically my remark or suggestion disguised as a, as a question. How would you think of that first part of your talk, if the organizing figure were a chiasmus and not um, a kind of parallel or synecdoche or metaphor that follows from Nazism into Americanism, but this more complex figure where we do not know where A and B is at the end because the historical interchange Nazism and Americanism is at once something that touches at the metaphysics of, of what was called Indian hating by another uh, book, uh, but also a more recent history uh, and a very modern history of European racism that's still with us and that's still directed against, as it turns out, different kinds of Semites. Well, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll, let me just quickly say that I did allude to Whitman's book uh, as I quickly, I know I'm speaking too quickly, but um, okay. Sorry, I the, um, 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 with Trump's election, we've had several sort of books for the wider public 
uh, that um, emphasize the um, recourse that um, National Socialist legal teams had to Jim Crow laws in writing the Nuremberg Laws, uh, and of course to reminding us of the admiration Hitler expresses in Mein Kampf for the Lebensraum that was you know, seized by, by the US and the extermination of the native population. Um, um, so, I mean, I, I would agree, I'm, and thank you for the thought about the rhetorical trope of, of chiasmus, um, which of course is a crossing, as you, uh, and it's, it's uh, and my only hesitation there is that um, if we're going to go back to, to um, Demon and some of the thinking that he did about these rhetorical tropes, uh, Demon um, thought of chiasmus as a totalizing trope of, of, of mm -hmm. identities. Um, uh, and he identified particularly with what Schiller does to Kant, right? Um, uh, you know, if one crossing and another crossing and there's a balance and you get a, a, a balanced sentence such that um, um, America is, is national socialism, is America is national socialism. Whereas if you stick with it with a more of a doubling pattern, doubling as Derrida shows again and again, you know, it looks like it's specular and, and contained, but in fact, and of course you know, it starts with Lacan, in fact it's a violent uh, structure that's enormously unstable and, and, and generates replications that can't be controlled. So I, I'm a little hesitant about the trophicasmus, but I'll have to think about it more because I agree with you that it's very important to think about the, uh, the many cross-Atlantic transmissions um, uh, that, that happened, I mean, from Hitler's covert admiration for, for Mickey Mouse and, you know. Um, yeah, because I mean, my, my, my main misgiving is you know, the figural part was just the staging of it, but obviously fascism is as American as American pie. It's not a question of if and when. This country invented more than fascism. It's not that it's not something to be borrowed externally from the Nazis. That's my political concern about. Well, let me make very clear. My quotations here are, are I'm quoting what's circulating in the media, particularly in the wake of Trump's election. I'm not endorsing. I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah, just just so we're 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 clear on that. Although I'm, I mean, as you know, fascism is an enormous, enormously difficult um, term to define, and um, I would like, in some ways, to to um, um, skirt the edges. I, I mean, one has to, of course, make investments and make make claims. And there's a certain kind of soft totalitarianism or soft fascism that, you know, from Horkheimer and Adorno and before has been diagnosed as central to Tocqueville, even in a way. <laughs> to, uh, on the other hand, fascism literally, I mean, there's, or, or in a more narrow sense, um, you have an Italian model, you have a Spanish model. Those are far more influential if you think of 20th century fascisms in the more ordinary sense, right? Generalismos uh, taking control of of, of, uh, of political processes than, than, than Hitler. And as you know, there's a body of literature that wishes to distinguish Nazism from fascism, you know, political science types for whom that kind of question matters. Because of the, because of the. of American fascism is only to white Europeans. And everyone else, it has always been pretty harsh, I would say, since Tocqueville time. Yeah, and the, the, um, I mean, the distinguishing character of Nazism, of course, was its emphasis on race, which not until 1938 did Mussolini, you know, write into, under pressure, write into uh, Italian uh, law. He really wasn't interested prior to that in race. He, his fascism was different. Uh, and race, of course, in the U.S. has defined, has saturated political space from the beginning of the founding of the country. Um, so that's... One reason I, I try to make sure that even though I go to La Coule about and to you know, high level questions of metaphysics, I try always also to, to keep in mind how very important the, the category of race and, the, and, and, and whiteness is, you know, who counts as white. And, um, and some, of the, um, some of the pop cultural texts that I allude to quickly here, if any of you have seen Iron Sky, for instance, or any of these these films, some of them are quite shrewd about the way in which they play with the fact that 
not everybody gets to be a Nazi, you know? I mean, in a way, fascism in the Franco and sense is more open, you know, just be a fascist and go to, go to church and join the army. Uh, um, otherwise, we'll kill you. But, but, um, but once, uh, once the annihilating logic of race uh, starts to enter, um, you know, you have a slightly different dynamic. I don't mean that these things can be simply quarantined, but I am interested in the bizarrely uh, bulimic and, and powerful um, circulation of, of Nazi imagery, you know, everything from cats that look like Hitler to, to the most poisonous kinds of, of, of political language. Mm -hmm. And it, it clearly has to do with the racial uh, issues in the United States. I don't know if that, I, I'm not trying to evade, I hope I'm not trying to evade the question. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I have a question and a half, and I'm going to have to preface this by saying sorry. I, as Billy actually knows, I fell down a Hannah Arendt rabbit hole over the weekend, so that's sort of like he's nesting in my brain. I feel like and like it seems to push everything else aside. There are worse but things. But having just uh, <laughs> basically read the origins of totalitarianism over the weekend, I'm kind of wondering if you have thoughts on how the concept of shame, like whether or not that plays. That is at play in these pop culture representations and in this fascination with fascism. So sort of, I'm just sort of thinking of like, do we have to counter this white pride movement with like, is that a form of white shame, like having to turn the Nazi into this figure that we can laugh at? If that's at play there, and then I was also kind of thinking on how Adam sort of talks about the movement from classes to masses. If you would, mm -hmm. so if we're talking about American fascism. If then sort of the United States is like telling itself that it's this classless society and all men are created equal, and if that might play a part in it in like current political formations, if we're talking about like mass culture and like the social like a social media presidency, and if like the masses have anything to do with it. Poof. Thanks. That's a great question. Although um, there's a lot there. Let me see. Um, um, shame. Um, um, well, if we're talking about a political praxis for dealing with um, um, contemporary um, neo-Nazi white power or thinly disguised versions thereof, um, I guess the the more shame and ridicule, the better. Uh, these seem to me to be potent weapons. Um, uh, and they are weapons that um, um, help these movements cohere in the first place. Mm -hmm. If you've read any of the literature about you know, the, the, the 4chan people who hide in their parents' basements and, and type out hate, you know, I mean, there's uh, um, um, fear of women, fear of being cuckolds and they're, and they're, you know, it's just endless and horrible. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, often uh, a news article will mention the successful gambit of a German town, the name of which I should remember, that had the brilliant idea of, of uh, donating to an anti-fascist charity every yard that neo-Nazis marched, you know, <laughs> when they come to march. It's brilliant and, and also produces a, a kind of confrontation, it seems to me, that's Politically feasible and uh, you know local and um, anyway um, when there's enough political will in the local area. Larger question of of um, I want to say something larger. Um, um, let's see, shame, ridicule. The only other thing I would I would I I want to throw this out. Um, I'm interested in the way in which figures of the Nazi have constantly, from the 1930s, been associated with uh, doubling replication, technical reproducibility, um, uh, the, the ease with which the forelock and the mustache of Hitler can be parodied. I mean, Chaplin was only one of, I mean, of, of, of many uh, uh, um, um, people exploited that. Um, so, um, 
um, there's a way in which, in which um, uh, of course, accelerated by wartime propaganda, um, there, was, there was always a, a certain kind of, um, of um, potential for parody and humor built into, it seems to me, built into the, the ironically, given their poisonous power, you know, the symbology of, of Nazism, um, which didn't work, for instance, with in the Cold War against Stalin, I mean, it seems to me. Um, you, you, had, you had all sorts of hate speech against communists, but they don't, they couldn't be processed in quite the same way that, mm -hmm. that Nazis were and are. So that's why, in the end, I, I want to pull some threads from, you know, a post-Heideggerian take like La Kula Barton and Alcise, where they're thinking about um, modern techniques as, among other things, the um, culmination of a metaphysics of the subject, right? The subject that controls the world and puts it on order, except at the same time it's precisely that which, which uh, devours the, the human as, and, and makes the human part of the standing reserve that, that modern techniques puts on order. Um, I think that, I think that needs to be part of my, my talk. In that case, that's, that's my gambit. I'm curious, I think this may be slightly related to that last point you made, um, but of the, of the sort of question of popular culture, mass culture, um, and of more sort of anti art on what you know, this, this installation that you're, that you're talking to display, like, which seemed to be, you know, like, I wonder, okay, I think you rephrased this a bit, um, and I wonder how you might, you know, because you, all of your sort of Can you say that again? I'm All these, these were essentially like dangerous representations. Dangerous. Not, even, even in parody, right? They still represent a sort of doubling of ourselves. And this seems to be, you know, your critique of mass cultural objects throughout. They're not necessarily dangerous. I mean, part of the, to me, ickiness of the adaptation of Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle is that you have a gray haired Hitler in season 10 being wise about alternative worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, I don't know, uh, in Germany there was a book and then a film, um, Alice Vida Da, Look Who's Back, um, which was about Hitler waking up in 2015 and he can't get work so he becomes a Hitler impersonator. And parts of the book are, have some mild humor, but um, it's a one joke book that gets a little tiresome and it has very little, it's disturbing how normalizing it is. It, although I, anyway, but sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm essentially thinking of this wilkiness and how it, how it comes, through, comes about through that, right? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you're saying it's this, what makes the human thing is this. But I'm thinking of a different book, of course, that's kind of very interesting. It's the Nazi Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, And so I, that's what I wonder about is like, do you see, um, where do you see the value of, of um, an expression of, of cultural vulnerability um, if there is a value there? Because I didn't really have any uh -huh. that in the past book. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, we're in technics. We don't have a choice about it. Um, and I really don't want to uh, um, leave the impression that I'm associated in modern techniques with Nazism in any, in any way that's not, you know, sort of local and cult culturally encoded in a certain context. Um, um, the techniques as the, as the pharmacon, as that which can both be um, poison and medicine. Um, as usual, she was taking everything from Derrida anyway. Uh, I, I would agree. I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that seems to me correct as an analysis and 
and um, 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 the uh, the images of Nazism are certainly symptoms of a certain kind of poison, right? An effort to reestablish a, a, a state, a stability, an economy of the self, as Sam Weber puts it, um, in some fashion within within the technical dispersions of a of a mediated world. Um, but if, but it can take very lighthearted or very dangerous or forms. Yeah. That's what's weird, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was kind of, I was wondering more about the split, so I can kind of understand more closely what's going on. Well, I parceled them out that way, but it wouldn't, I, I don't have an, I, I would not stand by that, that difference doesn't hold as anybody knows who seriously starts studying the one or the other. I mean, let me just give you one example, a novel I love, Gravity's Rainbow, Thomas Pynchon, a novel that's very smart about a lot of these themes. Um, if any of you have read the novel, uh, you know that one of, the one of the things that happens in Gravity's Rainbow is that um, 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 the, the British uh, Secret Service uh, seeks seeking to, to, to sow fear in, in, the, in Germany, create the myth that there are black SS soldiers uh, from Southwest Africa, right? And then it turns out that there actually are within the myth of the you know, Herero um, um, peoples who've been brought to Germany, and Enzian uh, is a major character in that novel. What, I mean, it's a complicated novel. You could read it many ways. You could decide whether or not this is a, you know, how to read it. But in certain fashion, uh, it's just a massive um, um, disruption, you could say, of, the, of, of all the, the, um, the phantasmatic uh, uh, racial codes that, that um, you know, swirl around, around Nazism, the SS. Um, it's all about the V2 rocket. Um, you know, everybody's in search of the V2 rocket in that novel. So, um, is that pop culture? Is that high culture? It's gravity's rainbow. I mean, but that you'd say the same thing for any, any text that you read carefully. It seems to me. well, maybe not dead snow. It's <laughs> popular culture, Absolutely. but I love it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud along the same lines. I think that maybe an excellent essay was the proliferation of, um, of, of references to Hitler and how he's become this cult figure in let's say pop. I don't know the high or low scale studies or newspaper, um, especially among young people, and especially I think among boys, because these representations of very typical hero brands and expressions of violence, they were bound up with, you know, in the history of Africa. Um, and I haven't done any serious studies about this, but I, I always react in horror <laughs> and dismay, because as a European, I think of Hitler and Nazism as a kind of end game, as, as a kind of, that's almost like and I think very seriously that the European Union's foundation on never again, and that's anything else that's growing up in a post-Nazi country. And, uh, and, um, and so I wonder, you know, and, and you've talked a lot about this, so what, what is this about? It, it, it's a kind of, and, and, and you've put your finger on this ambivalence of something very familiar to the point of unrecognizability because it's essential to American violence. At the same time, something that has to be obsessively marked out, and I think this 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 obsession has to do with, with navigating those two poles or keeping them together. Um, but I wonder, I wonder what what happens uh, between the parodies, which I think is probably the majority of of these representations, a kind of clumsy distancing, and the fascination that that turns to uh, an admiration for Nazi. So, and I don't know that this is kind of a sociological question. I'm not a sociologist, but as anyone who's done any work on whether uh, the sheer um, presence, the volume of the parody uh, is on some kind of spectrum they don't mm -hmm. turn towards mm -hmm. um, excessivating or, or giving weight or voice to the, the dangerous kind of fascination. In other words, the, did Trump court 
I don't know that Trump is dead. No, Trump didn't cause this. He's a symptom, but uh, it is a I'm symptom. sure. Right. Well, he's a fascinating symptom. I mean, put aside our terror and horror for a moment. There's something weirdly. I mean, the media and us included, we can't stop talking about this guy. Yeah. There's something. But the, the Hitler legend, the Hitler stuff preceded Trump. And I don't know that I, I, <coughs> he is, he's a figure in this, but oh, yeah. oh, does, yeah. the, does Cam turn into a fascination that makes people watch? Yeah, I, thank you. That's, a, that's really well put, actually, because that is exactly what I'm trying to write about. Right. That's what fascinates me <laughs> about fascism. Um, the fact that you have um, these, the camp and the, and the, you know, the first person shooter games for, of course you shoot Nazis. Uh, that they're like orcs in, in Middle Earth, right? You can just kill them. Uh, that's understandable. It's not that interesting to analyze, but then you, you have all these other phenomena that cluster around, um, uh, as I was saying, the swastika does, uh, although of course it, it can, can be used in all sorts of you know, campy decor, but it's always ready to, to uh, have its poisonous power. Um, 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 uh, and um, I want to try to, uh, find some way of linking those two things. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I am, I do think that there's elements in the La Coula Belt Nancy analysis that help us there. Um, um, because what they do is they help us understand that these insecurities uh, about identity and self uh, are bound up with technical mediation and um, and that the, the Nazi as a figure of a kind of extreme, which can then be a comic extreme or a politically invested extreme, an extreme fantasy of sovereignty, uh, um, uh, uh, of, of identity, uh, of, of, uh, of racially, racially uh, uh, marked identity that would, that, would, that would create a border that would be less permeable, than the sh the, what the shibboleth, uh, the, than linguistic or, or, or cultural borders that are always permeable. That's the fantasy of race, as you have it actually from in 19th century writing, uh, you know, uh, Gubineau and Wagner on the Jews. I mean, if you, if you read these, um, language will come up again and again in those, in those texts uh, at, as uh, kind of a site of anxiety because um, um, the danger is, of course, that the, that the Jew speaks German better than the German, right? It can't be. Um, so you need some kind of, of racial identity that would be less permeable. So racism is a fantasy of an impermeable border, which, of course, is ludicrous. But um, um, So, yeah, I'm trying. Thank you. That's exactly the problem that I, I think is worth addressing in a text. So I'm trying to do. About the politics of La Coula Party, which I think is a different question now. That is a different question now than it was before Trump. Mm. Ah. Uh, because we yeah. were, I mean, I, and I'm intrigued to read La Democracy and talk to media studies and, and talk to media writers with a media and with the, the goal of some kind of intervention. Um, and, and somehow the, the interventions that we have um, we're used to and we have been using in our teaching and elsewhere have become the kind of representational studies that we're also engaged in a more theoretical fashion. And I think that's why it's a somewhat, I think it's important not to homogenize the media when we talk about intervention. Very good point, I agree. Not even sure. in a higher yeah. fashion. It being much more precise, I think this has to do with social media and the influence of social media. Yes. How we understand uh, representation. It's uh, yes. all been lumped together. Yes. You know, all the, Yes, I, 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 th I, let me just say, I accept that. I, I think you're right, and for something like this, I, way too much homogenization is going on, as I say, the well, media. It's but but uh, it's a very important point. And I think the, um, um, the I mean, as we are reminded in very frequently in smart journalism in the last few months, um, what is it, uh, Google 
was founded in what, 2001, Facebook in 2003. I mean, these, these are extraordinary, I, I think I may have the dates a little wrong, but this extraordinary compression of change, and rate of change and acceleration that's simply extraordinary and it has clearly uh, had an enormous impact. It's very media specific. Yeah. yeah. So we have about two minutes left. I know that Kendra has a question. Are there other questions? I think, and then I also have a question. Nick, can we ask three questions? Yeah. And then you, you could respond kind of broadly or, or whatever stands sure. out to you. Does that sound okay to you? Ask me these questions three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my my question is following up with the article too. Article. Article. Um, uh, about media representations and this the question of proliferation, which maybe goes also back to the question of um, pharmacology, um, where. You know, the, what's, because Trump is not only a symptom, right? Um, there's also, and I don't want to like emphasize kind of this sort of like causal event or coherent, but there's also kind of, um, yeah, uh, intensification that happens mm -hmm. with someone um, with, with such a kind of big figure, a very important figure. I lived in Sweden um, at the moment when first um, national party member got a seat from parliament. And this really weird shift happened in their media where like no one would introduce a speaker before. The news totally ignored them. And then all of a sudden they had a seat in parliament and now they were on the news. Um, so um, take her serious. question because you definitely I think explored this these questions in your talk. Um, I'm wondering what distinguishes Americanism as a form of nationalism? Um, or fascism. Or fascism. But also nationalism. I mean there was a point in your talk where I fully expected you to say nationalism and you said Americanism instead. Um, and you also said that Trump lacks a nation shaping ideology. So it just kind of um, got me thinking about the speci your specific working definition. that has to do with all the things that they're thinking about, but I'm going to be that person today. Um, because, um, and we were talking very briefly about this before the talk, that you know, I, I feel like, you know, I agree, uh, Kendra, with your characterization that, it, that, that Trump's not just a symptom, but that there's been a certain intensification. In other words, a year ago, something happened, and even if it just happened in our own kind of psyche, collective psyche or individual psyche, something happened. And I, I feel that there's a need to not only act differently, but also think differently. So without sort of thinking, okay, there's been a rupture, there's a complete distinction between before and after, you know, I want to, I'm suspicious of those kinds of um, kind of extreme, um, not because they're extreme, but, be, but the, the idea that, that what was before, uh, that what is now wasn't all, all already uh, here before, because it clearly was. Yet, I, I think that um, there is this kind of demand to, to think differently. I mean, we're all academics in this room. So, so what, what does it mean? I mean, it, it, in some ways your talk was a performative answer to, to, to this question, but in, this, in some ways I'm asking you to kind of um, be more explicit about the connection between the first and the second part um, of the talk, because I think that, um, you know, reading for so, the ship could be one one example, but there could be others. Um, is is absolutely a way to confront 
um, you know, the, the economy of the self that, that Sam Weber described that we see in these, in, in these populist culture um, references, because my fear is that <laughs> I sort of have this image like, at some point he's just gonna go away, right? And then, and it's a fantasy that I feel like a lot of people share, like, and then he'll go back to normal. Well, normal was not something that, that we were happy with. <laughs> so, so my fear is that, my, my fear, but then also, you know, I, I think is an opportunity, um, how does this intensification or event or non-rupture, rupture, allow us to, you know, intervene, to think, newly um, about, say, identity, um, so that we don't just go back to thinking about, um, about politics in this country. I mean, if you look at kind of the typical liberal, the typical conservative uh, discourse, they're all kind of identity bound. So how, how can this be an opportunity to, to really think um, differently? And, and, and how would, Deconstruction, and I, I say that because you mentioned Devon, you mentioned Derrida, you mentioned people like Sam Weber. And, um, well, how would that be different than, say, critique? Okay, thanks. Answer uh, all of our I have two minutes, right? Solve all of our problems. Two minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, let me start with the middle one. Um, sorry, uh, tell me your name. Lacey. Lacey, thanks, because I got the other two. Uh, uh, Lacey, I, I'll start because I think I can answer it really quickly. Um, I was quoting a famous quote from the 1930s that's usually ascribed to Sinclair Lewis, but erroneously it was some New York Times reporter who said that uh, if fascism comes to America, it will come draped in the flag and will not be stamp made in Germany, mm. right? Um, and of course, um, begs the question, you know, and, and I was using that, that quote because, because I wanted to draw attention to the weird prominence of swastikas and Richard Spencer's and people like that getting media attention, stamping their discourse made in Germany. Of course, the White House distances itself from that, but there's also obviously a dog whistles being sent out. Uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's the political era, area in which... Uh, uh, um, as to Americanism as a specific form of nationalism or fascism, uh, that's a huge question. I'm gonna sidestep just a little bit because, um, well, because there are two other questions. <laughs> but maybe we can, maybe we can talk more over coffee. Um, I know people are gonna have to go. Um, uh, Sandra, is that? Yeah. Uh, I agree, there's been an intensification. I mean, it's, it's, the, uh, you know, it's like the f suddenly Facebook is there and then a few years later it's, distorting elections. Uh, there's been an intensification with the, not just the election, but for the campaign. The Trump campaign itself was, was a battery of, of, of strange distorting effects within, within the impoverished and massively moneyed, uh, I mean culturally impoverished, mass, massively moneyed American electoral farce. Um, um, uh, and, and Trump wasn't supposed to win, and, and you, know, you had this, this uh, uh, quite terrifying and, and, and remarkable event happen. Um, so, um, and yeah, this is an energized and galvanized right-wing uh, political activity as well as hate speech, um, at the very least in Europe and the US, because that's, I, I, I can't speak for the rest of the world because I, too ignorant, but um, and um, and I I started this project long before Trump was um, even running, um, but um, it has to take account of the Trump effect. I do try to do that in the talk, but there's, it's it's going to be a constant effort. And then Aaron, um, how dare you ask me that kind of question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, how to think differently, how to deconstruct. Well, uh, deconstruction is different from critique in at least this sense that deconstruction does not, um, Im does, does not uh, indulge itself in the fantasy of a simple and pure break or distance or meta language from which uh, that can isolate, quarantine, and expel um, um, its object of analysis. Um, 
not that critique simply does that either, but, but that's, the, that's one of the emphatic gestures, I think, with deconstruction. Um, and then that's, of course, sometimes interpreted as a kind of defeatism or a compromise. But, but it, it, I think that if you really you read the people who do it well, uh, you know, there's a uh, deconstruction is a, is a, a, a um, um, an infinite commitment to, to critical thought. Um, a willingness to pursue critical thought past, as it were, one's own best interests. <laughs> past, uh, and, um, and so, you know, when Derrida left us with such resonant and, um, thoughts as, um, um, the absolute exposure of democracy, for instance, to that which can destroy it. Uh, there can be no democracy that does not expose itself to, to, um, 1933. At the work that does not expose itself to the worst, right? Or a hospitality that would be to complete, that would be true hospitality, uh, would be a level of vulnerability that could actually could not be sustained, uh, even ethically. Uh, so that's the complexity of a deconstructive thought. <laughs> um, uh, it's not simply an ethics of hospitality in the ordinary sense, but but nonetheless, it thinks hospitality with greater faith, you could say, than or at least if you're me and believe in the deconstructive project that Derrida launched. So I do, think, I do think that these thoughts are more necessary than ever in the era of acceleration and intensification that, again, didn't start with Trump. It, uh, but but um, Trump was, of course, a, a frightening moment of acceleration because the American president has such a frightening amount of power. So that's the best I can do, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much.